Um, hello everyone, welcome to our, I think it's our fourth Gardens Wildlife presentation now. My name is Heather Stewart, I work as a Biodiversity Officer at Cardinia Shire. Uh, Cardinia Shire Council acknowledges the traditional owners we are the land that we're on, which are the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri people. We pay their respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, you will learn all about lovely lizards from the biggest lizards we've got through to the teeny tiny geckos that we were mentioning before. Uh, thanks for attending this workshop. Due to COVID restrictions, we've had to move our program online. So we thought it was a great time to try out some of these online workshops and we've been really happy with the turnout that, that we've got from them. Uh, if you complete tonight's workshop, you'll be sent a link to register for a free plant voucher worth $20 for the Cardinia Environment Coalition Nursery at the Deep Creek Reserve. Uh, the Deep Creek Res oh, sorry, the nursery will be open from the 30th of April this year. So it'll be newly opened very soon and you'll be able to come down and get some plants. Big Creek Reserve is Council's premier environmental site. It has a natural playground, a wetlands, a cafe, golf club, and now an Indigenous plant nursery. So you'll be able to come down with your friends and family, have a day out and plan your new wildlife garden. So I think we've already been introduced to Richard and to Kim, who are our wildlife gardening gurus tonight. And uh, let's settle in for the next hour and learn about lovely lizards and feel free to put any questions that you've got in the question and answers section and I'll ask them as we go through the presentation. Thanks Richard. Beautiful, thanks very much Heather. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, this is a bit, bit of a special occasion to some degree. This is the first time I have presented this um, this particular webinar. So um, it was, we've developed it based upon the request from the Cardinia um, Council. Um, and also the one we'll do next week is a new one as well, which is about some of our beautiful mammals that we have um, in, uh, in and around uh, Melbourne and our suburbs and, and regions. Um, so very excited to be presenting this. Um, and Kim, who is with us, with us here tonight has helped me with some of the content um, and very much has a very strong wildlife and wild care um, um, perspective on things. I come more from the gardening perspective um, and so Kim will also be able to provide hopefully lots of information from the more wildlife perspective as well. So hopefully through the two of us we'll be able to answer all of your questions. Now let me just share my screen so we can start. So yes, attracting lizards and reptiles. Now I have put reptiles in there because lizards are a part of the reptile family. And to the extent that we will be attracting lizards, we're potentially going to be attracting some of the other reptiles as well. So I'm going to cover off on them, but a very major focus of tonight is going to be on our friends, the lizards. Before we do start, I'll just let you know that your cameras and microphones have been turned off um, and you can ask questions um, through the Q&A button. So just any time through the session, if you've got a question, just throw it into the Q&A section. Um, everybody can see the questions and I think I've also set it up if you've got some responses that you could share as well, you can potentially add to it as well. Um, there's also a chat section there. So if you have um, some comments, some resources that you'd like to share, some observations that you've made around your garden, um, then try and put those ones into the chat section, um, just so that we can make sure that we have all those questions nice and clear. Now we are making a recording of tonight um, and also there will be notes made available um, and they will be available with the other recordings. Um, so you'll get to the same web page that we've used previously. And so you'll have, even if you've missed the previous um, webinars that we've done uh, with Cardinia, you'll have all of those there that you'd be able to go back and watch them. And that will be issued out in the next couple of days. Now I'm just going to make, do a very quick little poll um, so just to get a little bit of an idea of who we have online tonight with us. So in front of you, four or three little questions would have popped up. Uh, have you heard about SGA before? What sort of garden do you have? And how many people are watching your screen? So I'm just gonna let that go for maybe 20 or 30 seconds. Let's see how we go. And see what, who we've got with us tonight.
So I understand that Cardinia is quite an interesting and varied um, um, sort of region. So it has, you know, from, from cities to urban areas to more country areas, all also going down into the coastal areas. So there should be a, a good diversity of different types of gardens. And that also means, um, because you're getting more into that, that, um, that um, regional type um, environment, that there's potential a lot of lizards that you're going to see around in your areas. Okay. We have some pretty big lizards too, Richard. So Don't know if got... anyone else has seen the lace monitor. You have got them, okay. Oh yeah, the first time I saw one in a tree up in Tonnenbach, good gosh, they, they are giant. Yeah, so we will talk about them briefly as well. So excellent. So I'm going to end that poll now. I do apologise for anybody that I might cut off in mid answering, but we just need to um, sort of keep moving on and I'll quickly share the results. So about 64% have heard of SGA. So for the other 36, the other 10 that have answered, um, I'm gonna give you a very quick little summary of SGA in a minute. Um, the gardens that we're looking at is really interesting. This is one of the few places where I've got the majority or the largest portion of large gardens into medium. Quite often I get a lot of smaller and courtyard as well as the medium. So um, lots of bigger blocks and acre blocks and bush gardens maybe. Um, and who's watching? So about 86% are on there um, with themselves, but there's a couple of couples and even two groups greater than three. So that's excellent. Um, very good. So welcome everyone. And I shall just uh, finish that off and we will make a start. So Sustainable Gardening Australia or SGA, we're a non-for-profit organisation. Uh, and what we focus on is help, helping people to um, understand what they can do in their garden to help the natural environment and protect the natural environment, um, to grow healthy food for themselves. So it's about our own health as well and building community. And we do that by providing training, um, by doing lots of webinars these days. Um, our website, um, we have um, a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to called Cuttings. So our website is sgaonline.org.au. Uh, we're on social media as well. And we've been around for over 16 years. So there's lots of lots of information um, and we're always putting up new articles and different things that you can do and more research. Um, so really great resource. If you haven't been onto our website, check it out. We've also got a Friends of SGA or a FOSCA group, we call it. Um, and this is about us building a little community to help support us with a small financial contribution of $25 per year. Uh, that helps us to um, continue on with providing the free resources that we, we provide. Um, and um, as a result of that, you get access to an additional newsletter, I think it's quarterly, um, called Thrive. Um, we've got um, discounts to our masterclasses, which are different training um, opportunities that you might want to be uh, have a look into um, and also some discounts from some of our business um, supporters like the Diggers Club and the Lost Sea and Seed Collection and, um, and a few other places as well. And so you can find out more about that on our website. But what we're here to talk about tonight is the reptile family and more, uh, more, more specifically the lizards. Now for those that have been on um, some of the previous webinars, here's our little ecosystem. And so this is how an ecosystem sort of looks. It's layers of, um, of, of, of different types of animals through the ecosystem. Um, and this is what we try and represent or re reproduce, I should say, also in our gardens. For it to be a healthy ecosystem, which is what our really garden is, we need to try and encourage all of these levels in our garden. So from the good quality soil and the soil food web and the life in our soil, which then grows all of those beautiful plants, which are our gardens. Then we have all of those herbivore animals, which like to feed off our plants from the bees and the butterflies looking for nectar and pollen um, to you know, all sorts of different animals that might be looking for leaves or other resources. That's where sometimes we can get some of our garden pests coming in. And part of the reason why we get some of these garden pests is that we don't have as much of this next level up the secondary consumers. Because these are the ones and the further ones up, the tertiary consumers at the top, they're the ones that predate on the lower levels. They're the ones that keep it in balance. And so if we're missing some of these levels in these carnivorous animals or the secondary consumers, what it can mean is that the, um, the ones below can burst out in, in populations and we can get some, um, some issues with, with in our veggie gardens, for example, with different types of bugs and so on. 
Now, lizards fit within this secondary consumer level. And so they are carnivorous and they will eat lots of other sorts of little insects and snails and things like that. And, and um, so they're a great uh, little animal to have in your gardens to help provide that balance um, so that we could try and um, remove some of those um, excesses in, in, in pests that we might have in our garden. So they are great things to be having in our garden. So we're gonna find out the ways that we can try and um, encourage more lizards in our garden. And you know what, we might even have them there, but sometimes we're just not aware of them. Um, and you might be able, now that you've go through this, you might be able to sort of recognize them and um, their, their signs of them being around as well. So a few reptile facts, just to have a think about the family of the reptiles. And it's made up of a number of different subfamilies. So there's the lizards that we're gonna talk about tonight. We are going to briefly talk about snakes because um, they will also be potentially around. Um, the turtles and the crocodiles. So we do not have any crocodiles down here tonight uh, in, in Melbourne. So I'm not gonna be talking about crocodiles, but the other three I will be briefly talking about, or the, snake, the turtles as well. Now, as we will know from, um, from school, uh, most likely, lizards are cold blooded. So they don't generate heat through their own body like we would. Um, and so it's called their um, ectothermic, which means that their body temperature varies with the outside temperature. And so they get their warmth from the sun, okay? It also means in winter, they potentially aren't very active. Now they have scales. So you can see the pictures on this blue tongue here with their scales. Now, what an interesting thing I found out through doing some of this research, which um, Kim also may be aware of, is that some of the lizards lay eggs, but some actually give birth to live babies. Okay, so there's, there's sort of different, different parts of the lizard family will do different things. And you have to remember also that they're usually very shy. They're non-poisonous. They're usually very shy and they will try and escape if they're feeling threatened, okay? So the lizards in particular are, um, are like this, but even snakes um, will prefer to, to flee and escape rather than actually attack. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, Australia is pretty lucky. Um, we have so many different, um, very unique types of animals in Australia, including um, our reptile family. So there's about 850 different species. Um, and because of the way Australia has um, evolved and been separate from the rest of the world for such a long time, our, um, our, even our reptiles are quite unique with about 90% being unique to Australia. But there have at periods in Australia's history, we have been connected to other parts of, of or other continents um, and other parts of the world. And so a little bit of research I found out was that the Komodo dragon um, is actually from Indonesia. So that's those really massive um, um, lizards originated in Australia and are hybridized with um, the sand monitors that are still around. And so the connection through across Australia into Indonesia and so on is very strong, but it's been a long time since we've been connected by land. So within the lizard family, there are five um, particular families. Okay, so there's the skinks, so the, what we often see is the small ones. There are geckos and there is a gecko down here in, in, in Melbourne, but it's sort of introduced, I think, but it's still a, a local gecko. We do have a dragon. So we're gonna talk about the dragon. We also have um, a legless lizard, which does actually look a little bit like a snake. Um, so they were very, um, in the past, they've, they've been across Melbourne, but they're much more concentrated now, the population's more in the West, um, but um, you know, there are still some sightings that happen in other areas. So you might've seen some of these around. And then as Melissa was mentioning, we've got the goannas, the sand monitors. So it's a, the largest of the families. Um, as I mentioned earlier, lizards, great in helping you with pest control in your garden feeding on all sorts of insects and larvae. And the bigger ones, like the blue tongues, will quite happily um, you know, be looking at snails and slugs and so on as well. So as a part of an integrated approach to gardening, an integrated approach to pest management, um, lizards can be seen as a biological um, strategy in trying to eliminate the pests that might be in our gardens. And so they're an important thing to be encouraging. I might just say, I can see there's a couple of questions up there. Oh, sorry, I might just see if there's any questions at the moment before we have a look at our skink family. 
So we've got a couple. So we've, the first one is a really interesting one. It says, we've had some mice in our garden. Not now. Uh, would they have eaten my skinks because I haven't seen them around or is this a coincidence? And how can I recover their numbers? I used to see more than 20, but now they've only spotted three. Wow, that's interesting. Well, look, I, my, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. I don't think that the mice would be um, predating on the skinks. I'm not sure whether Kim would have a different view. Certainly skinks are a part of the food chain for lots of other, and lizards are a part of the food chain for lots of other animals. So if I just go back to the pyramid here, you know, there are a lot of higher order consumers that will be looking for lizards. So the, the birds, the predatory birds, but even snakes, um, which um, are also, um, you know, looking for things like little lizards um, to eat. So um, I don't think it would be the mice. I think it would either be um, environmental, so the conditions have, have changed in some way, or that there is a lot more predatory, um, um, other predatory birds and, and, and um, animals that are around. Um, also, you, we'll talk a little bit about cats a little bit later. Um, if you've seen more cats around, that could be part of the challenge as well. Kim, I don't know if you have any other um, opinions on that. No, I'm with you. I don't think it would be mice either. It would yep. most likely be birds or other habitat environmental issues. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so we will talk a little bit later about some of the garden design choices um, that you can make to try and um, or habitat you can put back into your garden that might hopefully encourage them to come back in. So we will do that as we're going through. Now we're going to. The last Sorry. question is not a question. It's one of our uh, regular contributors, Thornbills, asked me if I have a pet blue tongue lizard. And funnily enough, there is a blue tongue lizard that lives at my house, but I don't think he's my pet. He lives in the drain out the front. Uh, and he, well, I think it's a he, I don't actually know. We might learn tonight if about the difference between uh, males and females. He definitely pokes his head out each morning to get the sun. So we do have a blue tongue lizard. It's very cool. Excellent. And I've got a couple as well, and there'll be a few pictures in here. Um, they come out in, in spring, uh, looking a little bit skinny, um, and then they start fattening up through the season. So there's actually two types of um, 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 uh, blue tongues, or mm -hmm. there's actually a few more than that, but um, we'll be, you know, there'll be two of the ones that you potentially will be seeing. So we'll see some of those as we go through. So. Okay, skinks. Now, one thing I learned through doing this is that um, the skinks are one of the larger of the families, so you'll potentially see lots of different types of skinks. They are very common, okay, very common in our gardens. What I didn't know was that the blue tongues are actually a part of that skink family. So they're obviously on the larger side of the skinks. Um, and one of the features of this type of lizard is that they can drop their tails if they are feeling threatened as a, as a way of aiding their escape. So if a bird will pick them up or something will pick them up by the tail, they can drop it and then they'll run away. And it takes about approximately three to four months um, for them to grow back that tail. So it's quite a, a great superpower that they've got. Um, just shows that they're a very, um, a very timid creature that um, will get predated on by lots of um, animals. And as a result of that, they have evolved this strategy to be able to escape. So it's something that um, is a part of their nature. The smaller ones are very quick and very agile. So they're very hard to actually identify. Um, I have lots of skinks around, but I couldn't tell you what actually type of skink they are. Certainly the bigger ones, so the blueies um, um, are a much larger and slower one. So they're a lot easier to uh, identify. The small ones, usually between eight and 10 centimetres. And I often also see really, really small ones, uh, obviously the babies, which might be two or three centimetres um, as well. So, you know, they, they come in a range of sizes and really live in a whole range of habitats, um, including our gardens. And so it's really easy to encourage skinks in our gardens and we'll give you some, some ideas of the things that you're going to be um, able to do in your garden. And what do they eat? Well. And this is going to be a common thing in tonight's um, talk as well. Insects, other invertebrates, lots of moths and crickets and cockroaches as well. So lots of insects. And so a part of gardening for lizards is also gardening for insects. It's about encouraging insects into your garden because that is an important part of that ecosystem. It's a part of their food chain. So let's have a look at some of them. Now I've done a little bit of a montage here of a selection, just a selection 
of some of the lizards, the, the little skinks that you might see around. And if you look at the photos, you can see some differences between them. So the white skink down the bottom has got the little spots and the eastern three lying skink next to it's got that little red underbelly and that cool metallic skink um, is, or this metallic cool skink above it has got a bit of a more a coppery sh um, shade to it. But also, as I mentioned, they're very quick and they're very timid. And I actually haven't been able to identify or even realise that there is um, a lot of different varieties because they're usually gone there. You just see them out of the corner of your eye. Um, so, but there is a lot of skinks out there. Um, and this, as I said, this is a selection of the ones that you might be able to see. So, um, you know, there's, there's the Bougainvillea one, there's all sorts of different um, types of skinks. So this is an area um, in our gardens that we can definitely encourage because these ones will be eating a lot of the small um, insects and pests that might be around in our gardens. On the larger side of the skink family, we have the blue tongue lizards. So this one up above here, uh, there's two, two general varieties. This one up above here is the Eastern blue or the co more common one. And so it's got these shades of brown and stripes on them. And this is the one that comes out. This is actually near my shed. Uh, you can see the door of the shed here. And this is in just in last spring. Um, and it, it's been living under the concrete and also in the shed. Um, he also wanders around into my veggie garden um, where I'm quite happy to have him there looking for snails and so on. Then there's one which looks very different. And I haven't seen mm. one of these ones. And this is the blotched blue tongue. Um, and so it's got that very different colored um, and, and, um, and pattern on its back, almost pinky. This one is in color rather than browns and that blotchy sort of, um, um, sort of uh, a pattern on there. Um, so maybe if people have seen the blotch one, I'm sure you would have seen some of the blue, uh, the, the, the common um, Eastern ones, but if you've seen some of the, the, the blotched one, maybe just note that down in the chat so we can see how many people have, have seen them. Um, often found basking in the sun. So yes, these ones are a lot slower and they definitely do like once spring comes and starts to warm up, they come out of their hibernation or their, their um, too poor where they're basically in a, in a sense of um, a state of suspension almost. Um, and then they'll be looking for some warmth. Um, their tongues are light blue, so that's why they're called blue tongue. Um, and that is also a, a, a defense mechanism um, because it is used to try and frighten predators. So in nature, these blue colors or bright colors, are, it, it's often um, used as a warning for danger. And so that's why they're blue. So it's not like they've been eating lots of Slurpees or anything like that. Um, it is, a again, a defense um, um, because they're a, um, a mechanism because they do get predated on. So they can drop their tails and they've got the blue tongues. Um, not venomous or poisonous, quite solitary, except for when breeding season comes along. Um, can grow quite big, you know, up to a kilo and in full length with its tail, potentially up to 60 centimetres, but that's a very large one. And their habitats, and, and this is going to be similar for a lot of the, the lizards, is this sort of open ground, lots of grass and tussock grasses, lots of leaf litter and mulch is really good. Because um, that's where you're also going to get a lot of insects and so supporting their food. They like to have shelter under rocks and logs and so on. So having um, these elements in our garden, not cleaning up the garden as much as maybe we might do um, is really important. Having some logs and branches that have fallen because they will then part come part of the, the, um, the shelter. Variety of plants for feeding and animals, snails, insects, beetles, and then they'll also eat some wildflowers and some of the native fruits and berries like the, the prickly currant bush and so on. So, you know, even some of those indigenous um, fruiting um, um, plants are an important thing for them. Nesting is September to November. They, um, the males can actually search a pretty long distance when looking uh, for a mate. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the females will give life uh, birth to live um, animals, uh, live lizards, up to 20 or 25. So that's quite a lot. And they are actually potentially fully independent at that point of birth. So they can pretty, pretty much go out and start um, you know, hunting for themselves and looking after themselves. They are an important part of the food chain for other animals. So just because 20 or 25 might get born doesn't mean that that many will end up as adults. So part of the reason for having so many young is because so many will then 
get predated upon. So again, that's another mechanism of survival when you're um, being a hunted animal is to be able to have lots of young. So we see that in all sorts of things like uh, frogs and butterflies and so on, that you know multiple um, um, eggs or you know babies so that a certain percentage of them can uh, become adults. A few more questions there, Melissa. We'll yeah, we do. We've I, yep, we've got a bunch of questions because this appears to be a, a popular topic. Mm. Uh, so leading on from Sharon's question, would rats predate on lizards? Because this person had a rat plague in their garden and the blue tongues left for a couple of years. I, again, I wouldn't have thought so. I thought rats um, generally are um, either looking for rotting materials or dead materials or, or plants or things like fruits and vegetables and things like that. Um, Kim, I'm not sure if you have a different opinion on the rats. I don't know that they would predate on a blue tongue. No, not so much predate. I mean, look, there could be instances where they might attack them, but it's pretty unlikely. And yeah. rats tend to be more nocturnal and blue tongues are well and truly hidden away at that time, unless it's a specifically it, it could hot be, night. But. Yeah, it could be that they um, are out competing them for their, for their shelters. Hmm. Um, so it could be that they're throwing them out of home, potentially. So it's I'm definitely not quite sure on that. Possibility, yeah. But I wouldn't yep. say predation, no. Yep, yep. So, so we've got a couple of life questions. So how long do blue tongues live for? I understand they can get, live in, in captivity quite a long time. Um, in, in, in nature, not necessarily as long because they do get predated and so on. Um, but but I, I have a feeling that 10 to 15 years is not um, uncommon. But Kim, I don't, again, I don't know if you have a no, you're pretty on spot that. on for wild ones. I mean, I guess we, we don't know on average how long wild ones live, but in captivity, obviously, it can go right up into the high 20s. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I think you're spot on there. Yep, cool. Uh, and then how long do the little skinks live for? Oh, I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no reason. I mean, they are even probably, you know, more vulnerable to, you know, birds, scaring around out in the, the, the mulch and so on. So, you know, they potentially do get predated on quite a bit because that you do see quite a large numbers of them. Um, but I would have thought that, you know, they would generally have a reasonable life um, expectancy if they don't get predated upon. Um, so uh, we've got a good question. Do blue tongues eat rat bait? I could imagine that they could. Um, they can certainly eat snails that have eaten um, snail bait as well. Um, so I don't know whether they would be attracted to rat bait, but I certainly know other animals are like dogs and, and so on. So and, and so you can get a lot of other animals getting sick when rat bait is around. Um, Kim, I don't know if you've rescued any animals, that any lizards that have eaten rat bait or anything? No, snail bait, yes. Um, I've had possums in that have had rat bait um, yep. or secondary poisoning, something yep. eating, maybe a rat that's eaten it. Yeah. Yep, yep. So. Um, and the last one is someone spotted a blue tongue down the creek around their block and they want to attract them, the blue tongue to their garden. What, what could they do? Okay, well, what we're going to be doing in a few slides, we're going to be talking about some of the things that you can do to attract um, any lizards. Um, certainly you, you're not allowed to um, physically capture them and transport them into your own garden. Um, so it, it's about trying to create the environment within your garden that hopefully will attract them. Um, yeah. So that's going to be what we'll be talking about. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So there is another part, another one in the, the, um, the blue tongue family, which I haven't seen since I was a kid. Um, there are apparently still a few sighted around Melbourne, um, certainly more out the west and the northern parts of Victoria, you can see the shingleback. Um, so it is a blue tongue, it's got a very um, much um, bigger um, scale pattern on it um, and it doesn't have the long tail sometimes they're called stumpy tails but they still got the heart shape um, head um, and so you know these can leave up to 20 years up to 41 centimeters long and again they are very similar to the habitats that um, and, and the feeding and that a um, the blue tongue would have 
Now, apparently, they um, can be quite monog have monogamous pairs, mating pairs, and they'll even though they can live alone, they will reunite um, when it's when it's breeding time. So that's an interesting little um, little fact. And again, they give birth to live to live young. So I don't know if anybody has seen any shinglebacks or the stumpies um, around the, your area. So that would be interesting to hear as well in maybe in the chat. Now, there are a number of threats to, to reptiles. Um, and so it's, it's important that we understand what these are because then we can actually put actions in to try and reduce these threats. And some of them we can and some of them we can't, they're bigger issues. But about 7% of our reptile family, uh, reptile families are um, on the red list as being at risk of extinction. So, you know, th there is threats that happening to them. Habitat loss is certainly a part of it as we've urbanised our, um, our land, but also as we've um, you know, turned to agriculture um, and changed a lot of our land formations into agriculture, that has been a big issue for a lot of reptiles. Um, but introduced predators are one of the biggest challenges for our reptiles and our lizard family. So dogs, cats, foxes. Um, so yes, they will be other animals that would predate on them, um, you know, kookaburras and all that sort of stuff. But the introduced ones, whether it be pets, um, domestic animals, or escaped wild feral dogs and cats, um, they can have a very big impact on um, lizards. Chemicals, very important, especially garden chemicals and other pollutions. Cars, um, I have seen numerous, especially blue tongues, um, um, have been run over by cars. And so, you know, that's something we've got to be very careful of. Um, as a gardener, um, being careful to make sure that there's none around while you're mowing. And climate change is another thing which is going to impact our reptile families going forward. So just on a couple of these issues, just to, um, to, to focus on them a little bit, reducing the, our use of garden chemicals is really important. Um, partly for, or for two reasons, pesticides in themselves will kill the insects. Usually our pesticides are quite broad acting. And so even though we might think we're getting rid of just one particular type of insect, we can actually be removing a whole layer of food for the lizards. So less food, less lizards. Also the chemicals themselves can make them sick, especially if they are eating the, um, the, 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 the insects that have been um, sprayed. Um, and the example we gave before that is that blue tongues can um, and quite enjoy a bit of a snail. So if snails have been eating the toxic snail bait, especially the blue and green snail baits, um, then the secondary um, impact of that is that the blue tongues will then get sick and potentially die as well. Um, also, um, just be careful of the way you're using herbicides um, to kill weeds. Um, hopefully you can maybe do some sheet mulching or just some physical pulling of weeds, some slashing, so you don't need to use the, the herbicides. Um, but if you are going to use them, don't use them in a broad brush approach. Um, definitely keep to the, to the, um, the recommended um, um, directions, but also try and do spot applications. So that's not generally going other things through other things. Um, we encourage at um, SGA something I've called integrated garden management, and it's often called integrated pest management or integrated weed management, but it's about chemicals are still a part of it, but they are used later in the process. So you look at the physical things that you can do for managing pests, which are barriers and traps and, and those sort of things. At the same time, you look at the, the cultural things that might encourage pests, um, which would be the choices that we make in our garden or how we garden that actually encourage pests to come along. The way we use fertilizers, the way we might rotate plants, um, the way we might not, might not clean up our garden. And we've got lots of hotels for pests. Then we've got the biological controls, which are those controls where we get nature to do things for us. So in, in this example, getting some lizards into our garden to help fight the pests is really good. If these things aren't working as well as we'd really like, then we might look at a low impact chemical solution. Not a high impact, not a harsh chemical, trying to go for the lowest impact, but as a last resort, okay? Now, um, SGA is, um, oh, I haven't got it there. SGA is in the next um, you know, three to six months is going to be putting out a garden product guide. Um, which will um, be on a, a database on our website where you'll be able to look at the 
garden chemicals that you might use, the, the um, insecticides and so on. And it will show you the impacts on different um, types of animals and human health and so on. And also hopefully give you some um, indications of lower impact chemicals that you might be, um, be able to use. So keep an eye on that and that'll hopefully give you a more educated, um, um, a more education around what we can try and do in our gardens to reduce use of chemicals. I did mention cats and lizards. Um, I haven't got dogs in here, but Kim is going to give me some, some stats at some point in the future that I can add into here around dogs and lizards, especially the blue tongues. But cats are a particular issue. Cats, even though they are domesticated, many of them, although there is a huge amount of feral ones out there that have been released and, and gone wild, but cats have a very strong hunting instinct. Even if they're domesticated, they're happy, they're always full, they will always still want to hunt. And it's estimated, I've seen different uh, calculations, but it's estimated that the combination of domestic and feral cats kill about well, just under 650 million reptiles every year. Now that is a huge burden on our, um, on our reptile family. And even pet cats, they've estimated that a pet cat, um, by looking at their, their, um, their, their, their poo and you know, post-mortems and all sorts of things, they've estimated that pet cats can kill about 14 reptiles per year, which is about when you multiply that out by the number of pet cats that they think there are, that's about 53 million reptiles, mainly lizards, and lots of lizards um, per year. So you can see the impact that introduced predators can have um, on our lizard family. So some of the things that you can do if you do have a cat is try and train them to be an inside cat. Um, if you look at desexing your cat, um, you'll potentially actually give them a longer life. There's some, some research that says they'll have a longer life, but it also can dim down or reduce some of their hunting instincts if they're desexed. Um, it won't stop it, but it might reduce it. Also with your, your garden, make sure you've got lots of shelter spots for the lizards to hide in and escape. So we'll talk about what some of those things are, but it's about building up this um, resource of shelter in your garden. There's also some good resources out there. So the, the zoos and RSPCA have a website called safecat.org.au. Um, and that's got some, um, um, a whole website on you know, cats, being cat safe and wild safe at the same time. Um, the, there is a, um, a little brochure called Cats and Wildlife that's put out by birdlife.org.au. Um, these will be in, noted in your um, um, notes as well. So certainly have a look at that. Um, and there is some cat proof fencing um, designs on the Knox website as well, Knox City website. So you could have a look at some of the cat proof fencing and cat enclosure um, stuff there as well. Um, I'll do one more, which is the climate change. So this is the last threat one, and then we'll have a look at some more questions. So climate change is expected to, to impact all sorts of different um, wildlife in, our, in, our, um, in Australia and other countries as well, but lizards are not um, immune to this. So they're thought to be quite vulnerable. It's, it will impact on their availability of food. So as insects um, change, um, or, or their availability of insects to have food, being nectar and pollen, and the timings, all of that, that can potentially change the amount of insects. And we do know that through a combination of climate change impacts and chemical use, um, our insect populations are decreasing. So that is a big issue. The availability of water in droughts is, in, is going to be an issue as we have longer dry periods. So we can do some things about that in our garden. But there's also some research being coming out that shows that, um, that warm temperatures, temperatures in the nest may impact the babies in the eggs. And this was actually some Australian research that was on some of the dragon family. Um, and they actually found out that the, the warmer the temperature, the, it's not a nice word, but the dimmer the babies were when they grew up. So some of the, they had lower intelligence because of some of the heat issues. Um, and many reptiles actually reproduce, reproduction is tied to temperature and moisture levels. And so as moisture levels change and temperatures change with climate change, there is 
expectation that this may also impact the reproduction and, and the of, of lizards. Um, so you know, there's some things that we're gonna have to be quite careful of. So I might just see if there are some questions that's, and then we're gonna yeah. have a look at, at the Jackie Dragon. That's the next one we're gonna look Ooh, at. So yes, we do have some good questions. So are lizards territorial? Do they live solitary in the garden or are they in families? Um, I think it would be a bit of both. The Jackie dragon, which we're gonna go into, is a little bit territorial amongst its other Jackie dragons. And it does these little movements, dances, as a sign language to other Jack, Jack, Jackie dragons to communicate and to say, this is my area. Others, I suspect, are a little bit less um, territorial, but um, Kim, you might have a, a view on that that as well. Depends what lizard it is. Uh, blue yeah. tongues are very territorial so they will fight each other and um, they tend to stay in the same home range. Uh, so the next question we've got is more a suggestion but Richard mentioned herbicide and pesticides so yep. uh, Thornbill has put a resource in the question and answer section about integrated pest management Oh, beautiful. And you can choose the types of crops and diseases and they will give you info on the types of chemicals to use, dosage, oh, application rates, as well as impact. So that sounds really useful. That's good. I'll have to have a look at that myself. So excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank um, you, Thornbill. Oh, yeah. Thornbill's a regular contributor. So yeah, we've got um, but good questions. So we've got a neighbourhood cat. I've got one of these too that is crossing the yard, possibly because I grow catnip this year. What can mm -hmm. I do to deter this? Cats are a challenge. Um, they're very independent. Yeah. Um, they'll do what they want to do. So certainly um, they like catnip. So maybe grow catnip somewhere else or not grow it at all. So grow it somewhere where you don't want the cats. There are some, some um, there is a book by Penny Woodward um, that has, um, uh, let's see if I can see it here next to me, um, that has um, some suggestions of um, some organic or herbs that you can grow, things like rue. Um, apparently they don't necessarily like, so rue and wormwood. So you could potentially grow, try and grow some of those around some areas where the cats might be. Um, but yes, cats can be a challenge, especially if they're your neighbor's cats or even if you don't know whose cats they are. Um, Kim, I don't know if you've got any suggestions on cats. Mm, not to deter them, it is very, very tricky. Um, yeah. yeah. So some of it can be, if you know, um, if I go back to this one here, if you know that there are um, um, issues and you know where the cats are, you could potentially get some of these brochures, for example, and just do a little letterbox drop and just try and without actually confronting the people, just try and give them some information about um, you know, how cats and wildlife can work. But you know, again, it, it's, it's, it's not just an issue about the cats, it's about working with the neighbours and that, that's a whole other you know, social challenge sometimes as well. It is, so I do know, and if, that, if the kind approach fails, the Shire does have a local law that says you need to keep your cat confined to your property 24 seven. And we have very popular cat traps that can be loaned out to anyone in the Shire. And if you happen to catch your neighbour's cat, it can be taken in and your neighbour will be fined. So that is the more extreme version of uh, yep. what can happen if you have a really pesky cat. Yep. And the last one we've got uh, is, do chickens eat lizards? And my chickens used to eat lizards. I know the answer to that is yes. Yes, so chickens will eat lizards. Um, certainly the smaller ones, not the bigger ones. So chickens will eat all sorts of different meat based um, products and so on. So if there's a little lizard running around, yes, the answer would be yes. Oh, and we have a suggestion from someone else that cats can be scared of balloons. So I oh. might go tomorrow and blow up some balloons and put them around the property and see how it goes. Could be a good suggestion. You just have to be careful what happens to the balloons after they've been used because balloons can be another environmental, have an environmental impact if they burst and then get consumed by animals and, and so on yeah. into our water system. So yes, got to be, it got to be, it's sometimes some of the solutions always have some of their drawbacks as well. Absolutely. So. Okay, the, dra the Jackie dragon, a very beautiful little um, um, part of the dragon family. Um, so this was actually one of the first lizards to be identified in Australia um, in around 1790. So it's been known off for quite a long time within, within the, you know, after white settlement, um, within the science area. 
Um, bright yellow mouth and the, 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 um, the dragons have, it's quite hard to see here, but they have along the crest of their back, um, these little, this little crest, this little crest of bumps or um, vertebrae. Um, so that's a part of what it helps to distinct them, to make them um, um, unique. And, and the way they run, and this one you can sort of see is they, they can run quite vertically. You quite often see the, um, the frilled necked lizard, which is a part of the dragon. When it runs, it runs on its hind legs with a, a vertical sort of um, um, posture. About um, 22 to 44 centimetres, so quite a medium sized one. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they are quite territorial and they'll do these little dance body movements, body language stuff to try and um, scare away or to inform the other jackie lizards that they're, that they're, um, this is theirs. Usually found in dry eucalyptus areas, forests and woodlands, under fallen timber. So a lot of this is very similar again, feeding on insects, flies, moths, caterpillars, grasshoppers. Um, and nesting, so they will, um, Mature, they mature quickly and can breed after one year, which was interesting. Um, and up to eight eggs, um, at least once a season. And so they'll be putting these under clutches of eggs, under bark and in decaying vegetation. So you can see some of the things that um, that you might need in your garden. And here's another thing that's um, temperature related. So the sex of hatchlings is determined by the temperature of the nest. So males are usually from a medium temperature females from a low temperature or a high temperature. And so you can see where climate change can potentially start um, playing havoc with some of those sort of things with, with this particular type of lizard. Now, what do we need in our gardens, into the garden side? Well, we need food, which is going from what we've heard so far, it's fruits and snails and insects and spiders and maybe even some other lizards. We definitely need some water elements in our garden, ponds or gullies, depressions, just little water bowls or something like that. We need some shelter in our garden, which is our garden. Tussock grasses, leaf litter, mulch, hiding spots in rocks or under rocks, in logs, cracks in the soil. We need a basking place because they're cold blooded and they need to warm up. So we need some rocks and bricks. Roof tiles are really good. Um, pathways, I always see some on the, the, quite often on the pathway. And then we need some breeding resources and places which are going to be, again, rocks and lo uh, logs and mulches, ground covers, tussock grasses. So very similar things that we need to have to provide all of these different um, habitat elements in our garden. The structure of our garden, uh, most lizards need resources that are at that ground level. So canopy trees, yes, great in our gardens for all sorts of different wildlife, um, maybe for some of the, the monitors, but certainly some of the mid-storey trees might be where that comes in. But it's in this smaller side, it's the understory shrubs, um, it's the ground covers and grasses, and it's the water, the rocks, the logs, the mulch. So these areas, um, you think about your garden and what gaps there might be in your garden to see if there's some things that you need to add into it. Native plants, really important. And again, this is more on the lower side of height. So there's a little list here that will be in your handouts, um, but lots of very low creeping um, um, ground covers, um, we've got the hardened berger here, we've got the native violets, lots of the, the tussock type grasses, the kangaroo grass, the weeping grass, the wallaby grass, all of those are excellent. Um, even the mat rushes uh, are very good, um, attracting uh, for lizards. Um, and then you can also do your flax lilies and, and so on as well. So all of these low grass and creeping and, and um, type of um, plants are very good for our lizards. Don't forget to do the mulching as well, very important element. So here's a little um, lizard, it's one of the geckos. So the southern marbled gecko, and what was interesting about this one, it's a nighttime hunter. So often we see lizards in the daytime, that this is a, a nighttime and having a light around, like on the outside of your house, potentially will attract the insects and therefore attract the, um, the lizards. They've adapted very well into our human environment. So they're often seen in, in, in around houses and they've got these little sticky pads on their, on their toes that enable them to climb vertical surfaces. They are common in Melbourne, but there is a theory that they originally came from further north of Victoria. And then through the transportation, this is part of urbanization again, transportation of lots of rocks and firewood, they've basically moved down into um, areas around Melbourne up to seven centimetres, 
hides during the daytime, out during the nighttime, feeding on lots of insects. Um, and you know, these ones only have a couple of eggs. So, and, and one other interesting thing here where I found out was the sperm in the females is retained in the body until late spring or summer. So once they've been fertilized, they can then later on um, lay the, fertilize the eggs and, and lay them. So um, it was just an interesting little fact there and a couple of eggs. Now this gets to what we can build in our garden. We'll do this one and then we'll see if there's some more questions. So we'll just go through a few lizard lounges. And so these are places for lizards to, um, to attract lizards. So they need warm places, safe places to warm their bodies. So lots of rocks. So this is a big basalt rock, um, but you can also use bricks or terracotta pipes. Um, even the roof tiles are really good because they have this natural curve in them where the lizards come up, come up underneath and get shelter and then they can come out onto the top. So, you know, these, the, you know having a few um, um, roof tiles hanging around your garden is actually quite a good thing. Make sure your lounge has some nearby shelter. So some hollows of some sort, lots of bark, um, maybe some rocks elevated a bit so they can get underneath. Um, we need a water source. So a little tray or a little bowl or something like that. And lots of these little ground cover type plants for hiding as well. Lots of leaf litter, really important, whether it's natural leaf bolt litter like this or um, bark mulches, a thick um, bark mulch. So here's some examples of some um, lizard lounges, um, not very, um, a little bit messy. And that's really the nature of the, the lizard lounge. So lots of rocks, lots of mulch, um, lots of areas that they can hide in under. Here's another one, a little bit more organized. So you can see all the little water bowls here. There's rocks that they can, they can lounge on. There's little um, um, sort of hollows and things that they can hide in. There's a bit of mulch and there's lots of plants around. Another one with lots of rocks. So again, you get the little bit of the feeling of what it's like and a, a bit of a terracotta pipe here that they can escape in. This is actually at my place. I, just took a photo of what was actually naturally in my garden. I don't actually think call this a lizard lounge, but I've got the big granite rocks, lots of little bits of low cover uh, vegetation, um, lots of natural bush mulch. Um, this was sitting here as well. So um, a, a log, a hollow logged, and then I just put the little um, basin of water down there as well. So that it's as simple as potentially doing something like that. Um, ABC, um, um, Gardening Australia also has a little clip on making a lizard hotel, so or a lizard lounge in your garden. So if you're interested, you could have a look onto the ABC um, Gardening Australia website to have a look at that. So we'll just see what other questions are there before we get onto the striped legless lizard. I think just one more. Let's get that next one. Oh, that's a good one. Do you know how to facilitate the hollowing process of logs? Um, well, these are the one I had. There's a natural one. So hollowing out of logs can take um, a long, long time. So basically, it happens when a log gets an infection or um, or something like that in it, and it basically rots out. And so it can take you know decades, up to hundreds of years, for a natural hollow to actually occur. Um, so I don't know particularly of a way of accelerating it apart from you know just. And it, this one that I have here, I have to say, this is came from one of our trees that um, got hit by lightning. Um, so the tree itself died. It was an old yellow box and we needed to make it safe. So, um, so it didn't break, you know, because it basically died. It was a couple of hundred years old. So we had the arborist come in and he took off a whole lot of um, limbs that were at risk. And then we had a lot of the hollows as a result. But it's really important that we don't necessarily go out into the bush and look for these things because they are a natural resource and part of habitat in that particular area. Um, so it's, it's more by being really selective of, of, of being able to get these through arborists, for example, or in your own property. No, don't have more questions. Okay. Um, now, this was an interesting one, and I reckon I've seen one of these around my place. I'm pretty convinced it was a, a legless lizard. It wasn't a little snake, but they look very similar. Used to be quite widespread in Melbourne um, and around Victoria, but through urbanisation and the disturbance of our grasslands and through agriculture, a lot of their habitats have been destroyed. Um, and so they're not as common now throughout the whole of Victoria, but they are 
there still seems to be quite a good population more in the west. So I'd be interested to see if anybody thinks that they've seen them in, in the Cardinia area. Um, they are rarely seen, they shelter under rocks, um, and which is where I saw one. And one of the ways to identify them not to be a little snake is that it's a bit hard to do this, but they don't have the forked tongue uh, that what a snake does. Um, so it's a bit hard to actually um, be actually seeing that because if it's a snake, you're gonna have to be very careful. They are quite long, up to 30 centimetres long. So they're quite a long little skinny lizard. Nati, and again, the, the type of habitats, it's the tussock grasslands um, in Southeast Australia. Um, and mainly now found around these Victor uh, Victorian volcanic plain areas. What do they eat? Well, surprise, surprise, spiders, crickets, grasshoppers, caterpillars, cockroaches. And the females actually won't start breeding until they're about three or four years old. So it's very different than, than some of the other lizards. So I'd be interested if people have seen those ones around. Now, just very- our, our risk team is gonna tell me to say that you are not checking tongues of lizards and snakes in the no. Shire. No, that, that could end in quite badly. Exactly <laughs> right. So you just, if you see them, see I don't from know. From a distance? Just, yes, <laughs> absolutely not recommended. Um, now you might see one of the other families of the reptile family is the um, is the, the turtle family. So there is the common snake neck turtle, which has a quite a long snake, uh, quite a long neck um, that you might see around. And these often um, can be seen um, moving between waterways, um, water bodies, and often can get um, injured um, and their, their shells cracked if they're run over by a car or something like that. These ones can live quite an age, so up to 25, up to 50 years. Um, and and um, you know, if you've got a waterway near you, um, you might actually see them around. They also spend quite a bit of time on land as well. So they'll breed basically through the water systems, um, but they can actually send, spend a bit of, bit of time on land as well, walking around. So um, you probably would have seen some of those somewhere around through Cardinia, I suspect. Absolutely. Now, that also introduces the other side of the reptile family that we have to be extremely careful of, which is about snakes. Now, if we have a habitat that is of, of interest and um, um, supports lizards, you have to be aware that you're also potentially got a habitat that snakes will be attracted to, because lizards are a natural part of the snake's diet as well. So it's part of that ecosystem. You gotta remember that snakes are protected. Um, they're a native animal, they're protected, and it's illegal to kill them. So there's a few things that you can do to try and eliminate the risk. You're not necessarily or reduce the risk. It's very hard to eliminate the risk of having them in your, in your garden, but you can try and reduce some of the risks. So trying to remove some of the places where they could hide, um, especially close to the house, like under sheet metal, um, under wood heaps. It's funny, I, well, it wasn't funny at the time. I did some mulching. We've got a mulcher. We um, you know, did a lot of pruning and mulching and I put all the mulch on top of a tarp and I left it there for a couple of weeks. And then we went to move the tarp um, and put the mulch on the garden and there was a snake underneath. So it had found a little little, um, little hollow underneath the tarp. So try and keep those sort of things, if you're gonna have them, um, like wood heaps and sheets of metal, try and keep them away from the house. If you've got a lot of grass, try and keep it short, especially in your garden beds, um, especially near the house, because they can really like to sort of hide around in the grassy areas. Reduce their food source if you can. So this is a hard one. Um, rats and mice is a very big part. So they're actually really good in hunting rats and mice. Um, but um, having rats and mice around your house will mean that there's another food source for the um, for the snakes. So try and keep the, the populations down. If you've got chickens, trying to control how they're getting food um, so that the rats and mice aren't down around. And also bird feeding stations can attract lots of rats and mice and therefore potentially snakes. If you've got a frog bog or a frog pond, they are another source of food for snakes. So you've got to be aware of that. Um, Keep your compost really healthy. So don't add lots of food and uh, sorry, lots of meat and, and smelly things into it. Try and eliminate rats and mice from your compost because that can also attract the snakes. Um, keep the shed tidy, use low ground covers like mat-like ones so the snakes can't get under them um, rather than the bigger bushes as an example. And um, install automatically closing external house doors. So if you have snakes around your house, so if you've got a pool, you've got to have externally closing doors, so automatically closing doors, but it's also a benefit for um, keeping snakes out. 
um, and attract, and these, I have got a family of kookaburras and this is in my veggie garden. Uh, and so I feel not necessarily 100% safe, but I still feel better if I've got some of these carnivore birds around that will predate on the snakes. So keep, keep an eye out for having some of those as well. When gardening, wear boots, long plants. If you know they're around, leather gloves. Um, make lots of noise before you start going into areas that, um, that might have snakes into them, thumping on the ground. And avoid putting your hands into places where snakes potentially could be in sheltering. So be very careful. There are, um, if you see a snake, you've got to keep your distance, bring your pets inside and the kids, observe it, keep an eye on it where it's at and call the snake catcher. Um, use it as an opportunity if you've got kids around to really talk about safety, but also about the role of snakes in a healthy ecosystem. It's about generating respect in, in everybody so that, um, that we can actually live with them as such. Um, if you found a, um, a, an injured snake, you can call the wildlife rescue. If you get obviously bitten, then it's um, apply, apply the tourniquet and ring triple zero and get an ambulance out there as well. There are a few that we might see. So there's the tiger snake. It's quite can be one of the more aggressive ones. It's probably the fifth most venomous in the world. So it is something we need to be very careful of. Um, very much attracted to water bodies. So if you've got some water around you, um, it's one that potentially could be around. Um, and um, they actually can sort of climb up trees a little bit as well. So you do have to be quite careful. Um, the other one is that is quite common is the Eastern Brown. And this one is, and I have seen these around my house, um, is the second most venomous. So this just shows you the level of respect and caution that we need to be um, having if we've got these around in our garden. Um, and so it can be aggressive and like a lot of our reptiles or snakes especially, they are actually would prefer to flee, to get out of your way unless they are cornered. Um, it's unless they are provoked. So again, it's not about trying to, to capture them or to kill them. It's about trying to get them to move on because they don't necessarily want to be around you either. Um, and there are other ones, the lowland, these ones aren't as poisonous, but there's a lowland copperhead, the white lip snake, the red bellied black, uh, and the little whip snake as well are potentially common around our areas. So, um, before we, I think we're just about finished. So I'll just see if there's some more um, questions and then we'll just quickly do a little slide on wildlife rescue. If you actually do see a snake or a, a lizard that's been injured, what would you do? Um, so we'll just see if there's any other questions first. Uh, so the first one is, could I use a broken terracotta pot turned on its side as a hollow? That's yes. creative, yeah. Yes, you could. Absolutely. And you could pile a few of them up and create a little, I don't know, a, a little apartment for them. Um, and the last question was, this presentation created on slides or some other program? Oh, it's on PowerPoint. So yes, so PowerPoint <laughs> so and will, will be available to people after the session too, if there's any bits that they've... Yeah, yeah, not the slides won't, but the, a recording of it will be made available. Absolutely. So. Now, if you right, um, we've got one more, one oh, yep. more, just as we're talking. Uh, okay, if a snake keeps moving towards us, what can we do? Um, I would say try and move out of its way. Uh, it's usually if it's going towards you, I suspect it is because that's the way it's come, and it's trying to escape, even though it's coming towards you. So I'd be moving to the sides. Um, Kim, do you have any other suggestions on that? No, I'd probably do the same. Or I might, I might stand still first just to see if that makes it stop. And then if no, then yeah, slowly, maybe slowly, but kind of hastily move to the side yeah. and just keep your eyes on the snake. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's one of those really cautious things. Um, again, as, as, as a general rule, um, they will want to escape from you. So if they're heading towards you, either there's something behind them or that's actually seen, they've determined that that's their escape path for some reason. So you need to try and move away from the escape path. Um, now, if you come across an injured wild um, um, animal, whether it be a, a blue tongue or something or other, there are some things that you might be interested in doing. So this is a little kit that Kim develops, which is a little wildlife car rescue kit. Um, certainly not with snakes, you're not gonna be touching them, but with other animals, you might be interested in um, being able to um, uh, 
apply some some or getting them to a vet or something like that. Um, so a little pouch, having a little um, kit in your gar in your car might be an option for you, um, which would have some towels, some blankets, pillowcases, lots of gloves, scissors, hand sanitizer, um, some masks, and some spray for. Um, Maybe I'll let Kim talk about that one, but just having a little kit in your gut in your car might be an option, okay, that can help you. And what you need to do if you do find an injured animal is a first of all, be safe and cautious. If they're injured, they're potentially going to be frightened and they're potentially, even though you're trying to help them, they may think you're trying to attack them. So they can potentially scratch or bite you. So you have to be very careful. So one of the first things that you would do is um, you know, ring, ring um, Wildlife Victoria Emergency Response Service. So there's some numbers around that you can actually call them. That would be your first option. If you think it is safe to handle them, then you'd pull out your kit and you'd be looking at a, a blanket or a towel or something like that to wrap them up in and put them in a box. So with air holes, um, don't feed them, don't give them water, transport them um, to the local vet. Um, and so local vets will to treat native wildlife without it for free generally. Um, and so that's something you could potentially do with that. But definitely um, don't do that if you're not comfortable doing that um, and ring the Wildlife Victoria or some of the emergency response um, groups that can be quite regional as well um, to let them know that there is a, an injured animal around. Kim, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. No, you've got that pretty spot on, yeah. Beautiful. And I think... The last one, let me just say, yet yeah, the last one is what we talked about right at the beginning is the largest of the lizards, which can be seen still around Melbourne. There are some still around in Melbourne, but definitely in Cardinia, the yeah. lace monotail, the tree goanna, up to two metres long. And these will live in the trees. Um, and so they're this black brown cover with these sort of yellowy sort of and spots and stripes on them. They are listed as a vulnerable um, animal. So they are, um, through habitat and other issues, they are considered to be um, habitat destruction, to be vulnerable. Living more in forests and woodland environments, and they'll use the trees to shelter in. They forage for carrion is basically for um, animals that are dead. So, you know, they, they potentially will, um, this is how they can get hit by cars and things like that as well. But we'll also eat in insects and in other invertebrates, um, other reptiles, small mammals, birds and eggs. So they're quite a carnivorous um, animal as well. Or I suppose they're omnivores because they'll eat um, some of the other things as well. But um, yeah, they are a very an impressive, very impressive um, lizard to have around. Um, and so obviously, um, um, you can see those around in Cardinia in maybe in maybe some of the reserves. I'm not sure if anybody would have seen any in their gardens though. Yeah, we've got them on a more, um, I'd call them semi-rural type property. So they come in through the Bunyip State Park yep. and they come down in the properties in that uh, Tonumba, top of Mary Knoll sort of township. So you're right, near heavily forested areas, which is obviously where they're living. And yep. we know that they are taking people's chickens. So oh. they're, having, they're having good fun. Oh, they'll be looking for their eggs as well, if not the chickens as well. So. Possibly. Yeah. So. But they are pretty cool. They are cool, uh, absolutely. Darren says, he's ha I've had them in my garden, but I'm not sure what township you're in, Darren, but definitely oh. in the Shire. Excellent, excellent. Very good. So is there any other questions there? Yeah. No. Darren's no. just saying he's in Jimbrook and they've got them there too. So they must be going north as well. Beautiful. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's pretty much it for tonight then. It's really about, if you want these little creatures in your garden, it's about building out the habitat. So it's about having shelters and rocks and logs around. It's about having your, your leaf litter and your mulch um, around, having a little water source there. And hopefully by doing that, you'll get lots of insects around, which will become part, part, part of their food chain as well. Um, so yeah, just be careful though, because you know, having these sort of habitats will also attract some of the other um, reptiles that we might not necessarily want to have as close to our house. Um, so just be careful as well as you're doing it. So, so um, yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very much, Kim, for sitting in tonight. Um, been a pleasure. Thanks, Richard and Heather and everyone. <laughs> and Heather. And um, next week, we're going to be doing one on mammals. Um, so some of the the, the, the furry, fluffy, um, although we'll be doing kidneys as well, so they're not as furry and fluffy and cuddly. Um, 
But um, yeah, if you're interested, um, I think there'll probably still be a few tickets available, Heather, that people can come along and listen yeah, to that. Yeah, a couple left, but yes, also a very popular session too. Beautiful. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.